you guys don't know me, my name is Rusty Bailey. My, uh, my wife, Laura, and I, who, say hi, Laura. She's back there. I'm going to get in trouble for that. She and I have been married for 11 years. We have two awesome kids, Allie and Austin. Allie is nine, and she loves slime. Right? Anybody else have daughters that love slime? Yeah, I hate slime. <laughs> and then Austin, who is six, and Allie told me to tell you that he likes avocados. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know where that comes from. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this. Yeah, I like avocados too. So anyway, hey, Pastor Taylor, uh, when he comes and, and speaks, he always has a funny joke, right? So I thought today I would bring you guys some funny jokes to start this off. The problem is, is that my humor is a little different. People don't usually get it. And so if you don't get my jokes this morning, just laugh and nod anyways like you do get it, okay? So first joke, here we go. Do you guys know there are 10 types of people in the world? There are those that understand binary code and those that don't. <laughs> See, I don't know if you guys really got it or not because I told you to laugh. That's right. Slow clap. Slow clap. If you understand binary code, please tell the person next to you so they get the joke. Uh, how about this one? Which computer has the best singing voice? Anybody? Adele. Nah, see? All right, last joke, last joke. And this is a political joke uh, and a technology joke. So y'all will hate me all, all the way. I can't win with this one, but I think it's funny. All right, so have you heard that uh, Mexico has figured out a way to combat Trump's wall? It, it's true. They're going to hire Bill Gates to install windows. <laughs> yeah. See, but President Trump's not really worried because he said all of Bill's windows usually freeze up and lock up and you can't open them anyway. So <laughs> that's right. I love windows. So, hey, we have been in a series uh, called Dysfunctional Family, and it's where Jesus is the only one that can take the dis out of dysfunctional and make us a fully functional family, right? And so we started out with Joseph Salazar in our Next Gen service where he talked about how uh, Jesus was to be our example of parenting, right? And then uh, Pastor Justin here, he brought a message about how our church family, the only way we can have a functional church family is for us to realize that we need the church and that the church needs us, right? And then Pastor Nelson brought a series about how God is a God of order, and that how when we can put our priorities in God's order, then our lives will be fully functional as well. And then last week, Pastor Kerry brought a message about uh, to have a functional family that we need to bless our spouses. We need to bless our children. He, ha he has a whole book on the power of blessing. And so today, I'm going to wrap up the series. And I want to talk to you today about how we can take the dis out of our dysfunctional relationship with technology. Ooh. That's right. I didn't hear. There was only one ooh. Sorry. <clears throat> so you guys don't know. I'm the, I'm the uh, creative pastor here. I do all of the technology stuff uh, and, and help out with worship. And so they asked me to talk about technology. And um, so anyway, that's what we're going to do today. And really my hope today is a little different message. My hope is to be able to resource you guys with the tools that you can use to guide your family down a path of healthy technology. Okay, so if you look in, you guys in the front rows don't have them, but there's cards in your seat in front of you that say dysfunctional resources. Do you guys see those? Pull those out. Okay, take those home with you. Those are going to be the resources I'm going to talk to you today about, but you can take that home and use that to help guide your family. There's good technology resources as well as some bullet points to kind of help guide us through that. So I thought it would be cool if we start off by looking at some of the past technology and then some technology that exists today. And so, did you guys know the very first cell phone was a Motorola Dynatech 8000X? Sounds awesome, right? <laughs> Cost $4,000. <laughs> yeah. And apparently our pastor Justin Kaufman still has one. Did you get that when you are like five or something? Yeah, he still used it. I don't know where you were at, but it looks like you gained a little weight there. I don't, I don't know if that was supposed to look like that. Uh, also, the, first com the computers used in the Apollo 11 trip to the moon, did you realize that those had less processing power than your cell phone does now? That's crazy. And in 1984, Apple released the first successful mouse-driven user interface computer, the Macintosh. 
And they launched it in a Super Bowl ad that cost one and a half million dollars. I talk about inflation. I bet they would be happy for a million and a half dollar uh, commercial today. And so that's some past technology. Now let's, let's take a look at some new technology. If you are um, somebody who likes to scuba dive, like Brad and Mallory, I don't know if they're in here or not. They're here somewhere. But they love, they're over there. There they are. Those guys love to scuba dive. Did you guys know that they make a device now? Uh, there's a company called Like a Fish, and you can swim underwater without an oxygen tank. Yeah, so it takes the oxygen from the water and provides you with an endless supply of oxygen. So you can just scuba dive forever if you want to, I guess. Uh, but, or maybe, maybe you're uh, getting older in age and your eyesight is starting to go. Yeah, watch out. <laughs> it's called macular degeneration, and it's where the center part of your eye becomes blurry. Well, there's a company now that's created a microscopic telescope that can be implanted in your eye. Right? That's kind of cool, right? I wonder if this works. Like, like <laughs> can you zoom in and out? I don't, I don't know. If it does, that'd be awesome. They should make that. Or maybe you're one of the 74% of Americans that suffer from some sort of digestive issue. Instead of having to go get the procedure that nobody really wants to go get, right? You know what I'm talking about. You can swallow a pill. There's a company called PillCam now, and they put a microscopic camera in a pill that you swallow, and it will take pictures of everything, right? That's pretty awesome. Much better. Yeah. So today I thought we would look at how technology affects the way our family functions. And in order to do this, I think it's important for us to understand really how far we've come. So I want to go way back, right, to the Industrial Revolution. That's way back. 1800, an Industrial Revolution, really, it changed the face of America. It changed the way our families would function. How we worked, how we lived, how we raised families. All that began to change when this took place. And if you were lucky enough to have a kid in school, if you were lucky enough to go to public school, you learned things like um, the values in, of family, the virtues of family, religion, and community. But when the Industrial Revolution happened, all of a sudden common schools began to pop up and they began teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. And before the Industrial Revolution, we lived uh, in small, small farm-type communities, right? And everybody was a tobacco farmer. But after the Industrial Revolution happened, then we began to move into bigger cities. The machine kind of took over and we were able to create things. And so the Industrial Revolution really changed the face of American families. And it would take only 169 years for the next great revolution, in my opinion, to happen. 169 years later, there was the Digital Revolution. Right, And in this time, again, the face of America would change and really the world at this point because now the digital revolution, uh, it would completely, complete industries were born at this time, right? Jobs were created and destroyed by the computer. And so by 1980, the personal computer had made its way into our homes and now all of a sudden families, parents would have to figure out how to deal with this new craze called the video game. Right? I can remember being in elementary school and our school just getting computers. Right? We had to go and we saved all of our receipts from the grocery store and they created these computer labs. Right? You guys remember that? Oregon Trail? I mean, come on. Come on. Roughly 22 years later, the next revolution would happen. And on August 6th, 1991, the World Wide Web went live. Right? And there was no big press conference. In fact, most people around the world had no idea what the internet was. But you fast forward 28 years to today, and now there are over 3.8 billion people online. That's 40% of the world's population. There will be 8 billion devices by 2020 connected to the internet. And more than 570 new websites uh, are launched every minute. Here's one. Really, it kind of puts it in perspective for me. Every 24 hours, excuse me, every minute, 24 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube. More content is uploaded to YouTube in a 60-day period than the three major U.S. television networks have created in 60 years. So when you think about the timeline of technology in context to raising a family, you can see how that Our generation, this generation, is doing it in complete uncharted territory. There was 169 years from the Industrial Revolution to the Digital Revolution. 
and only 22 years from the digital revolution to the internet. And today, technology changes so fast. Every two years, technology is changing. What does that mean? That means that a student starting a four-year technical degree, half of what they learn will be obsolete by their third year. From the Industrial Revolution to the Digital Revolution, there was time for families to adapt. There was time for generation to teach generation to teach generation on how to raise a family in this kind of era. But today we're raising families in an environment that changes so fast that there's really no examples for us to follow. Because there's never really been a time like there is now. So technology has changed the way our lives are lived. It's changed the way we parent. It's become a force for both good and evil. On one hand, we have this massive access to this incredible library of information, right? And on the other hand, we have access to unprecedented evil. But technology alone is not the culprit. How it affects our family is it's our responsibility. You see, technology is it's just a tool. And the way that we judge the morality of any tool is by looking at the hands that hold it. Right? It's time for us to take responsibility and stop t- blaming technology for our own bad behavior. So... How do we do this? How do we take the dis out of our dysfunctional relationship with technology? I'm going to tell you in a second after we pray. (laughs) Bow your heads. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I just ask that you would come today, Lord, that you would open our hearts, God. You would open our eyes, that you would lead us and guide us to the uh, decisions that we should make, Lord, regarding our family in the areas of technology. I pray, God, that you would uh, be here and that your word would speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Does that have to excuse me? Has any allergies messed with anybody else? Mine were real bad. So this morning I took a Claritin D and Benadryl. <laughs> so if I just doze off, you know, somebody just wake me up, I'll be all right. All right, so the three steps to taking the dis out of our dysfunctional family. Step number one, we have to guard our own heart first. Right? Pastor Justin talks about this a lot. We have to get God's word in our heart. That's how our heart is guarded. Proverbs uh, 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Right? So you guys repeat that. Above all else. Above all else. Okay? It's important. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Every decision that we make, every word that comes from our mouth, every conversation that we have with our kids, Every conversation we have with our wife, every single thought that comes in our head comes from the heart. And so no wonder God is telling us, above all else, guard your heart. When we have God's word in our heart, we're going to think right, we're going to live right, we're going to do right. When we don't have God's word in our heart, we're going to live wrong, we're going to think wrong, we're going to do wrong. And that's great news. See, you guys are looking at me like, what? Here's the reason it's great news is God has created us where we can't think wrong and right at the same time. So how do you not think wrong by thinking what's right? And in order to do that, we have to get um, the word of God in our lives. A God-controlled thought life will govern your speech. It will guard your sight and guide your steps. How many times have you guys needed governed speech when having a... a, uh, debate or a conversation about technology in your home. Yeah, it happens to me quite often. So today I said I wanted to resource you guys, right? I don't want to just tell you these things and not give you anything to take and and do this. And so um, the first resource I want to share with you guys about is one called the YouVersion Bible app. Most of you guys have it. Raise your hand if you have this app. Majority of us have it. Okay, if you don't have this app, you need to download it, and here's why. I love the YouVersion app because it is a fantastic way to help hold yourself accountable, right? Accountability in reading your Bible is huge. The last thing you want to do is start a Bible study with somebody and then not do it. And on the YouVersion app, they can see if you're not doing it. But it's a fantastic app, and what it is is it's, it's the Bible on your phone or on your iPad or on your computer, and you can select uh, different plans, different study plans, and then you can pick friends that you have to read them with you. And then as you guys read it together, you can comment and everybody can see your comments and you can grow in the word together. So the YouVersion Bible app is fantastic. 
The next one I want to share with you guys is one that I just found while preparing this, and it is, it is an awesome app. It's called Pray As You Go. Now, if you're like me, staying in one place and being still and quiet for longer than about five minutes is ridiculously hard. That is my biggest challenge. It's because I want to stay and spend time, spend some quiet time with God. But what happens is five minutes after I get there, my mind is racing. And I can't think about the stuff that I'm trying to think about because other stuff happens. And so what this app does, it's called Pray As You Go. It, uh, it begins with some really good choir type worship music, which is, for me is always like, it helps me to kind of calm my mind, calm my spirit. And then it begins to read scripture in an English accent. I mean, come on. <laughs> I know, weird things, I know. Uh, and then, so as it reads the scripture, it, it gives you time to reflect on the scripture. It gives you prayer directives to pray regarding the scripture. And then it also gives you questions that you can think about, like, you know, characteristics of God and, and attributes of God. And it, and it allows you to put your focus in a way that, hey, you know, these are, and they're about 15 minutes or so. And I can begin to develop this lifestyle of prayer and learn how to calm myself. And so uh, it's called Pray As You Go. Download that. It's free. Next one is called Verses, and Verses is a scripture memorization app, right? And Pastor Kirk shared this one with me. This is an awesome app as well. Uh, we have to memorize scripture, and Jesus provides that example to us in the Bible, right? If you guys can recall, when Jesus goes and he fasts for 40 days, and then he's in the wilderness, and he's tempted by the devil, the devil says to him, if you're really God, turn that stone into bread, and Jesus, what does he do? He quotes scripture, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from God, right? We will find ourselves in situations, regardless of whether it's technology or something else, where we're being tempted, or we find ourselves in a situation where we need to speak some truth into that situation. And having the word of God in our heart, right, that's going to allow us to be able to do that. So Verses is a great app. It's, it uses games to help you memorize scripture. And the last one I want to share with you is called I Disciple. And iDisciple, I also just recently found this one. iDisciple is a great uh, app as well. What it does is it, it allows you to set up a profile where you can go on and select different topics that you like to study. And then it asks you, what are your favorite preachers and teachers? And it's got a plethora of them on there. And so you can select all kinds. You can guys see, I've, I like Tony Evans. So there's, a, there's a, a sermon that he's doing on discipleship. And so after you set all your settings, it compiles all these sermons and says, here, here's all this stuff. Here's some growth plans for you to guide you in this. Here, here's some music that goes along with it. And so it's a great app just to stay connected, a, another way to stay plugged in and, uh, and grow in the Word of God. Give me just a second. I'm going to drink again. I'm super dry mouth. I wonder why. All right, part number two. We've got to, um, after we guard our own heart, Right? It's our responsibility to guard the heart of our child and our spouse. You see, technology changes, but principles never do. And so it's our job to begin to build relationships that aren't based on technology. Right? Friendships aren't based on Facebook. Okay, Friendships happen on purpose. Relationships in our family happen on purpose. We have to begin to intentionally strengthen our family's relationships on a regular basis. Children who know that they are loved and cared for generally are going to make better decisions. And spouses or couples that know that they have each other's undivided attention, they're going to grow together and not apart. Did you guys know that your brain uh, creates neural pathways every day? And like a muscle, you either use it or you lose it. And they did a study recently in Britain uh, on cab drivers, right? They took taxi cab drivers who have to navigate the integral streets of Britain and, and they looked at the ones that used GPS against the ones that didn't. And what they found um, was, it's called the hippocampus. It's the part of your brain that is responsible for memorizing uh, people and objects and long-term memories. They found that taxi cab drivers who didn't use GPS had brain activity that operated at a much higher level. In fact, the ones that had more years of service without GPS had higher brain activity. And so what does that mean? That means uh, if you want to remember where your house is at the end of the day, you need to operate in that. And the problem is, is that technology just doesn't come and all of a sudden take over quickly. It happens in small steps. Like I can remember 
Who in here remembers uh, before the cell phone that we had to memorize phone numbers? Right? I used to know a ton of phone numbers. Like, I probably couldn't name 10 right now. Matt, here we go. We're going to play a game. You guys want to play a game? Here's a game. I've got a $10 Starbucks gift card here. All right? If you can remember one phone number without looking at your phone, raise your hand. Most everybody. Right? Five phone numbers. Five phone numbers. Ten phone numbers. Fifteen. Twenty. We have one person left? Yeah, I know. <laughs> John, how many do you remember? Is it twenty? At least twenty. Anybody got more than that? All right, John, you win, you win the gift card. Yeah, caffeine helps brain stimulation. Yeah, so not using that part of your brain is akin to, to doing, not doing arm curls, and, and you're not going to have any biceps. So when you don't use it, you lose it. Um, that means that we have a significant role in how our child's brain and our own brains are being wired on a daily basis. Have your, has your child ever asked you or your spouse ever asked you to, hey, get off your phone and pay attention to me? Yeah, it happens to me a lot, more often than, than really I'd like to admit. Um, so we can't blame ID10T errors. Who knows what an ID10T error is? All right, we, we, yeah, ID10T. Okay, technical ignorance does not excuse us from vigilant parenting. Right, we have to understand the dangers that exist we have to get connected, right, and join our kids' community. And how does that work? It, I think it works. There's several things that we can do to, to build these relationships and to build the, our child's relationship with technology in a healthy way. And that is we have to get an offensive strategy from the Lord. You see, in football, oftentimes when two teams are playing, uh, one team will, will get so far ahead that they stop playing to win. They actually play just not to lose, They'll pull their starters out, put their second string in, and they'll play not to lose. But as parents, we can't play not to lose. We have to play to win. And so what does that mean? That means that we've got to begin to be proactive and not reactive. Okay, we can't operate in fear when it comes to technology. And that's what, that's what happened. I do it all the time. Like when I was preparing this message, I was telling them earlier today, it was like God was slapping me in the head about every five minutes because if nobody else has, gets ministered here today, like I'm going to get ministered to. So <clears throat> we've got to be proactive, okay? What does that mean? Just like we have to develop our own heart with God's word in it, we also have to begin to de develop the heart of our child and, as well as our spouse, Okay, that looks like, um, for one, to build the relationships, schedule activities that don't involve technology. Right? Go hiking. It's, it, yesterday was a beautiful day. Go for a walk. Tell your family, hey, we're, we're going to do board games. Friday night, our family, we turned the TV off at dinner time and we played card games afterwards. Right? Do something that involve, that's a family-driven activity that doesn't involve technology. But when you have to talk about technology, we've got to begin to have open and honest conversations regarding the subject. What happens if your home is like mine, this is what happens. The, the kids are on the iPad and the TV is going and you're looking around and you're like, they, you, you know, mom comes home, nobody says anything. And it's this reality that they're on, they're too involved. They're too involved in technology. And so in that moment, what we do is we react. Right? We take the iPads, we turn the TV off, and y'all go tell your mom hi and go outside and play. Right? That's being reactive. And the problem is that's really just operating in fear. Our fear is, hey, our kids are getting too addicted to technology, their brains are going to fry, and uh, you know, everything bad will happen. That's our fear, and so we, we rip the technology out. But what we should be doing is we should be having open conversations about this with our kids, with our spouse, saying, Here's my expectations. Here are clear boundaries for technology, right? Do you guys have restriction zones where technology isn't allowed in your home? 
We try, to, we try to have it where there's no technology at the dinner table, right? You're not allowed to bring your cell phone to the dinner table. Not, our kids aren't allowed to have TVs in the room. They're not allowed to have the iPads in the room, right? And these may be crazy. You may be like, whoa, that's a little much. And it may be. You have to decide as your, as your own family what's right for you guys. But set boundaries. Uh, here's one that everybody should absolutely do, okay? Nod your head. Yes, you're going to do this. Your cell phones do not go with you to the bathroom, Right? Guys, we don't, we don't sit here like this, okay? It's gross. Did you wash your hands? Yeah, but I didn't wash my phone. Put it up to your ear and talk to somebody. It's gross. So there's other things called that we can do uh, to help leverage technology, and that is to use clean browsing. If you guys don't know what clean browsing is, basically it's a way to filter out unwanted content uh, before it comes to your home. And so there's a, there's a couple things. One of them is called Circle by Disney. I'll tell you guys about this in a minute. But, but there are ways, there are other ways as well, hop online and look for it, to filter out the stuff you don't want your family to see before it ever even gets to your house. Okay? Also, there's a couple websites I want to share with you. One is called commonsensemedia.org, and the other one is called kidsinmind.com. These are two resources. If you're like me, your kids find a new show on Netflix and you're like, I don't know about that show. Like, it could be good, it could be bad, I don't really know, and I don't want to watch 25 hours of TV to find out. Right, so commonsensemedia.org and Kids in Mind, what they do is they go look at video games, movies, TV shows, music, and then they give you reviews that say, here, look, here's what we found, do what you want with it. Right? They, they look at movies and they say, you know, if like 30 minutes into the movie, there's this scene and it uses this kind of language. And so you can make decisions as parents whether or not we're going to allow our families to view this kind of stuff. So those are a couple great resources. And the last thing I want to talk about in being uh, in proactive is to use a third-party app to help manage your kid's social life and phone life. Um, kids may not like it, but they'll, they'll learn to love it later. Uh, there's an app... If you have older kids, um, maybe in their teens or maybe tweens, and they're already involved in things like Facebook and Instagram, Kick, Snapchat, you know, musically, there's like 8 billion of them out there, and you can't monitor them all. There's a, a, a service called Bark, and what Bark does is it basically monitors. You put in all your kids' accounts, and it monitors them. And it doesn't give you all the information every day from all the accounts. That would be a lot to go through. But what it does is it looks for key things, uh, things such as bullying or things such as uh, inappropriate photos that get sent. It checks your email. It says, hey, uh, you know, you may want to check on your daughter because there's been some, some language that sounds like there's depression happening or there's uh, suicidal thoughts or something, whatever. It looks at all these platforms, and when it finds something, it gives you an alert and says, hey, check this out. The second one called Circle by Disney, I, I talked about it a moment ago. I actually just bought this and put it in my house this week because uh, I wanted to test it to be able to tell you guys about it. It's really cool. You can set up a device at your home on your network and then create profiles for all of your family members. And so I have one, Allie has one, Austin has one. And then you assign the devices. It looks on your network and it says, here are all your devices. you got phones and TVs and laptops and it finds the ones you have. And then you can assign them to the children and create uh, restrictions based on their age. And so you can tell it, I only want them to use the internet for two hours a day, or I only want them to use Facebook for 30 minutes, or I don't want them to use Snapchat at all. And so you can disable it. And you can also pause it on the fly. And so I was testing this with my wife and uh, <clears throat> she was over here and I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, I can't, can't do anything on my phone. It's messed up. And I was like, yeah, it's not messed up. <laughs> so last night she goes, uh, can you take these restrictions off? And I'm like, eh, maybe. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a great app. And then um, it, Circle by Disney does work only in your home for that specific thing. So when you leave outside of your network, it doesn't cover that. But they make an app to go along with it called Circle Go. And that app does cost, I don't remember how much it was, but it basically takes all of your settings that you've made at home and then uh, broadcast those to everybody's phone outside of that. So it's a cool service. Uh, the next one, My Mobile Watchdog. This is the last one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, My Mobile Watchdog is, works very similar. It does some different, it, it works a little different, but it's very similar to uh, Disney Go or, or Disney, Circle by Disney. And so 
hop online, look at these resources because each one is slightly different. You're, only, you're the only one that's going to know what works best for your family. But the point is, is do it, right? Be vigilant about parenting. Don't blame uh, ID10T errors as a lack of being vigilant for parenting, okay? You guys awake? Did y'all take Benadryl too? Yeah. All right, so last point here. And that is when mistakes happen, we have to show them the heart of the Father. And what's the heart of the Father? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Matter of fact, I want to go ahead and have the worship team come up. Um, You guys are going to be up here for a minute, but I don't have another place for you to come up. So, (laughs) Proverbs 15.1 says that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I, I can tell you that this proverb, I've seen it operate. I've seen it operate in my family because uh, a harsh word, right, stirs up anger. And what happens when we are acting in that reactive mode, when we aren't being proactive when it comes to something in our family? Division happens, right? That strife and conflict happens. And the Bible says a gentle answer turns away wrath. And so we've got to begin to show the Father's heart, show forgiveness in these moments, because I can promise you there will be moments, regardless of how many boundaries we set, regardless of how many safe nets we put in place for technology, mistakes are going to happen, not just on our kids' part, but on our part. One of the, I think one of the greatest stories, one of my favorite stories that really exemplifies forgiveness in the Bible is a, a story about Peter, and it's found in the Gospel of John. And in this story, we find Jesus, he's being arrested, right? He's, they've come and they found him, they're arresting Jesus. And Peter, in this moment, pulls out a sword and cuts the ear off of one of the soldiers. And they're wrestling. Everybody's in this moment of conflict. They ended up capturing Jesus, and, and he's being led away. And Peter breaks loose, but he's following at a distance. He's, he's trying to follow Jesus, but yet he doesn't want to be captured, so he's also trying to stay hidden. And so... They take Jesus and Peter's there and, and somebody sees Peter and they say, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter's response was, no, no, I don't know him. And so Peter's continually trying to stay with Jesus and somebody else sees him. Actually, two more people see Jesus and he says, hey, they say, aren't, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter's response is, no, no, I'm not, a, I don't know him. And so after the third time, a rooster crows, and in that moment, Peter recalls the words of Jesus. You see, earlier in that day, Peter was telling Jesus how he would lay his life down for him, how much he loved him, and Jesus says to him, Peter, I'll tell you this, you're going to deny me three times, right? And so in that moment, Peter hears the rooster crow, and he's reminded of those words, and all of a sudden, Peter is filled with guilt, how do I know this? Because if you keep reading there's, in this next few chapters, Peter isn't really mentioned anymore. And so he goes from being this main figure in this, in this story of conflict to now he's retreating. He's trying to hide and he has all this guilt because he's denied Jesus. And so later that day, they take Jesus and they crucify him. And it says on the third day that Jesus overcame the grave. They buried him and he rose from the grave. And Mary Magdalene is going to the grave to see there. She's distraught, and she just wants to be with Jesus. And when she gets there, she finds an empty tomb. The stone, the stone has been rolled away. And so Mary's thinking, was it not enough that you killed Jesus, and now you have to steal him? And so Mary runs and tells Peter and John, and she's like, they've taken him. So Peter is... Like he runs out frantic. They run down to the tomb and they get there and Peter finds an empty tomb and it's got the linen cloth in it and the handkerchief that was on Jesus' head. And scripture says, for a moment, he believed. Now you got to think, Peter's like, what is happening? See, they didn't understand the scripture that says he's going to rise on the third day yet. They didn't get that he was going to conquer the grave and conquer death. Later that day, it says that the disciples were in a room locked together, and they were hiding in fear from being arrested. And so Jesus shows up in this room, 
but the disciples don't recognize him. It doesn't say how he looked, but it was in such a way that they didn't really recognize him. And so Jesus is standing there and he's saying, look at my hands. Look at the hole here, right? Other gospels say that they were afraid. They thought they saw a ghost. And so eight days go by and again, the disciples are in this room locked, hiding. They're in hiding because their whole world has been destroyed. They don't know what to do. And Jesus again appears to them, shows them the holes in his hands, and again, they don't recognize him. And in the Gospel of John, it's the only book that recounts this story. There's a third encounter with Jesus. But this time, they don't come to the disciples in a room. This time, the disciples are at the Sea of Tiberias. And Peter's there. It doesn't say why they're there, but I have to think that maybe a a bit of time has gone by. And in Peter's mind, he's thinking, I've denied my Savior. I don't know where he's at. I'm not sure if what we saw was real. The only thing that I know to do is to go fishing. Right? The scripture says that he told the other disciples, I'm going to go fishing. And the other disciples say, okay, we're going to go as well. And so they, they fish all day and all night, and they catch nothing. And it says that there was a man standing on the shore, but they didn't recognize him. And he calls out and says, hey, did you guys catch any fish? And they say, no, we don't have any fish. Go find your own fish. They didn't say that. They said, no, we have no fish. And Jesus tells them to cast the nets on the side of the boat. Now, what's cool about this is that in Luke chapter 5, we find that Jesus uh, again, is meeting. This is the first time he's meeting with the disciples, and he's he's got a multitude of people that have followed him, and he wants to teach to them. So he tells Peter, he gets in Peter's boat, and he tells him, "Hey, go off the shore a little bit." And so he uh, he teaches the crowd from a little bit away from the shore, and at the end, he tells Peter to cast their nets off the side of the boat. And again, Peter does this. He says, "Hey, but look, Peter says actually, look, we fished all night and all day, and we've caught nothing, but we'll do it." And so they throw the nets over and they catch so many fish, it says that the boats were sinking. And in that moment, Peter recognizes Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, and he falls down on his knees. But check out what he says. Peter says, depart from me, I'm just a sinner. You fast forward and you look at this new story in John and you find Peter in a similar situation Jesus says, cast your net over, and they do, and they catch all these fish. But rather than saying, depart from me, Peter recognizes Jesus, leaps off the boat, and swims to the shore. Such an awesome, stark contrast. And so they're there on the shore, they're eating together, they're eating breakfast, and Jesus asks Peter this question. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Scholars have a couple interpretations of why he said of more than these. Some think that he was talking to the, about the other disciples, and some think he was talking about the fish in front of them. I tend to lean towards the fish. I think Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, do you love me more than the old life that you came from? And Peter answers and says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And again, Jesus asked this question. He asked it two more times. And on the third time of asking, every time Peter answers, yes, Lord, I love you. On the third time, Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? And and the Bible says that um, Peter was grieved. You see, I think in that moment, Peter was grieved because he realized Jesus asked him this question three times because he had denied him three times. And what Jesus was saying to him In those moments, the reason why Peter was grieved was because Jesus was saying, Peter, no matter how many times that you've sinned against me, no matter how how many times you run back to your old life, no matter how many times I'm going to stand on this shore, I'm going to reveal myself to you just the way that you know it's me, just like I did before. And I'm going to remind you of your purpose.
The heart of the Father is forgiveness. Church, every single one of us here operates in a dysfunctional situation, whether it's technology or family or marriage, you name it, there's dysfunctionality in it. The way that we begin to put to take the diss out of our dysfunction. We have to receive the forgiveness that only Christ can give. We have to ask Jesus to come in our heart. So this morning, we're going to pray. And if you're here this morning, you're like, you know what? I've been back in my boat. I can hear the voice of God calling for me, reminding me of my purposes. Jump out of your boat. Come down and and receive the forgiveness that only Christ can give. Let's pray. Altar team, you guys can come up. Jesus, we thank you so much that no matter how many times we sin against you, God, no matter how many times we deny you, you will always come to us in that familiar way. You will always find us no matter where we go. And you always remind us of our purposes. God, I pray today that regardless of the situation we find ourselves in, regardless of how dysfunctional it is, God, that we can begin to take steps to taking the dysfunctional and making it fully functional. Right now, I just ask if you're here and you need prayer for anything at all, whether it's, whether it's something to do with technology or anything else, family, you need prayer for anything, I want to invite you down. Jesus is standing at the shore calling your name. Come down and receive prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.